I'm I'm curious about you know Abel's exit from the group. You were in on a meeting that saw Abel out. Yes. So I don't think I don't know if Pablo was a part of that meeting, but you're saying you were as far as the votes. Did they did it, they ask? Yeah. The yeah, band? I was as far as the vote, but it didn't all come along all at once. The middle, there's a middle interlude in peace, if you listen to the album, and it, it sort of goes, it's very jazzy. Luis Gasca takes a badass solo. The interesting part is that on that song, David Rubinson didn't want it in. And so I just looked at Pablo, and it was like, we, I think we stayed up all night, you know until we got it just right. And so here was a pretty bold move on my part. I told David Rubinson, if you don't keep that part, I'm not playing on the record. Yeah, he was very intense, Abel. Intense when he played, ooh. It's like, I don't know, a time is like, you know, he would challenge you, you know, and I didn't like that. I, I, it really intimidated me about Abel. Mm-hmm. You know, and then that intimidation of, of you know, because it made me uncomfortable. There were separate meetings it wasn't the first time Abel got up into somebody's face, and he used to physically threaten people. And I know that it started with Abel kind of starting to nitpick on everybody. I don't know what happened. You know, uh, that was another management decision. It had, it had nothing to do with me. Mm-hmm. Uh, I've always, me and Abel, I've always liked Abel, man, you know? He would click something inside of me that I didn't like that I, I'd have to then, I have to either say something back or quit. Musically? No, not musically, but quit in, in yeah, in, in a way, I almost, yeah, I did quit. Because of that. Everybody, I think, knows about the name. We were playing in a high school gymnasium and stuff, and some girls came up and said, you know, uh, you know, they're, they're Malo. And I think Arsilio, and I, I don't know who else was there, and he goes, that's it, that's it, that's the name. So, yeah, <laughs> you know, so, you know, Malo means bad, but, you know, at that time, in the 60s and, and 70s, you know, the, with, people used to say, man, that band sounds bad, which means good. It's, man, you guys are bad. Why don't you call them Malo? Because Malo is bad. And that was it. Pablo and I became good friends um, during the course of the first few months of me joining the band. We, we became pretty close friends. And uh, we all lived together in, in a, out in Davis City. Uh, Pablo, Chris Wong, Richard Spremich, and George, we all shared a house. So we saw a lot of each other and we, and we became pretty, pretty close friends. So. It was Pablo and I, we, we would sit around the, the house a lot because we, we were kind of given a sort of a curfew in a way, you know, like the, the management wanted to keep a, a short leash on us to make sure we didn't get in any trouble. Because we roomed together, we, I mean, we, we practiced in the room and his way of approaching songs and doing songs, you know, he, different than me, definitely how I, you know, we, we hear things. <laughs> You want all the names? Yeah. I have Richard Kermode on organ. He's from Buffalo, New York. And uh, Louis Gasca, he's from LA, he's playing trumpet. And then later, they started talking about we we're gonna bring in some, some studio guys, or some guys to augment the five or six of you. So then I found out it was Luis Gasca, which was, man, I, to me that was like the greatest thing because I grew up listening to Mongo, his, you know, with him on it, and then I think Luis and Richard were, were, you know, friends from the Janis Joplin Cosmic Blues Band. Now, I understand that Bantova was the original Congo player. Well, he 
he, he, he did the recording. The original conga drummer was this guy I was telling you about, uh, Cliff Anderson, who was known as Chino. He was the conga drummer in the Malibus. When they got the record contract, um, I guess it was David Rubinson, uh, the producer wanted uh, wanted someone else, I guess. And he he, he knew Pantoja and, and, and Coca Escovito and had them come and do the recording. And they did a marvelous job, a fantastic job. We were prepared. I mean, David Rubinson used to have us practicing Walking on the stage, walking off the stage. I mean, I mean, as soon as they mentioned Malo, we would hit, you know. And then, I mean, this is all like training, and you know that. Thank God for uh, for him that you know he, he trained all this stuff. David Rubinson is was an astute guy. You know, I mean, he's, you know, the guy's been in the business. He knows he knew what he was doing. Yeah. And, uh, you know, very astute, and I'm sure he saw it all, and I'm sure that he had it planned out kind of, kind of, sort of, what he thought might happen in the studio. And it did. Luckily for us, it did. Malo was, um kind of a combination, a slight combination of, of like Santana and Tower Power. It was a Santana with, with horns, uh, kind of an idea. And the original Malo, I loved the first album so much because of the fact that Abel Zarate was also playing guitar along with, with, with George. And the sound of those two guitars playing uh, the melodies in harmony, kind of like how the, the Allman Brothers uh, would do, using two guitars and, and playing, playing in harmony. It's just a marvelous sound. And that's exactly how it was. We were all hungry. We wanted to get out there. Here was an opportunity. Hey, if you're going to give me a shot, I'm going to take it. This was for our first PR party at the Village Gate in New York, and this was written by David Rubinson. In a tiny Chicano nightclub overlooking beautiful San Bruno's railroad yards, not far from a million mediocre Daily City fantasies, a new band. The guitar player killed me. The singer killed me. The bass player really killed me. The other guys didn't. I knew that silly feeling, change this, change that, find a what's it, player, a who's it, a frim can't miss. So George Santana brought this dynamite another Frugan Smash band into my back office and rehearsal parlor. But what's this? A Chinese manager? Oh God, Santana, Garcia, Tellez, and Wong? Oh God. The next one the band would get would be a Filipino. That did it. We could get a grant from UNICEF. Chris Wong, George Pablo, Arcelio, and Abel. The bare bones, the beginning. Chris Wong, unused to the standard practices of the record business, feels uneasy about taking my loans. My wife, very aware of the standard practices of bands and their managers, feels even more uneasy. What makes us ever believe this will be different? Whatever leads any one of us to think for a second that these guys won't be the same as the others. I'll tell you, when that one happens and nobody gets screwed, and when things actually progress, Understand, they were pushing Jorge. That's why they used to call it uh, Jorge Santana and Malo. Jorge was always a real gentleman to me in high school. Always, you know, the nicest of guys. I can't imagine what that must have felt like. You know, I know he was nervous. I know he was nervous, and I know that uh, given the success of, of Santana, the first album, the second album, and now the third album, I'm sure he felt tremendous pressure that you know to live up to that caliber. Well, no, well, I didn't care, you know, as long as it's, you know, I mean, I, I was crying to the bank, you know, uh, I really didn't care, you know, I mean, me and Jorge have been real close all the time, mm -hmm. so it didn't matter to me, but, you know, it, it, what it, I'll tell you what it did, it frustrated, uh, it frustrated Jorge, because Jorge, Jorge, he just wanted to be part of something, just like all of us, you know, he didn't want to get all that attention.
answer your question, first of all, I didn't know the magnitude of what I was stepping into because I knew that they had a contract and we used to practice at the heliport in Marin. And to me, just that whole setting was really cool because they had their own equipment, they had their own recording area, and there was these different characters coming around that seemed to be important. And I thought, oh, this is pretty interesting. I mean, I didn't even really know what it was. And I met George. And, but it, it, to me, it wasn't, I never got that, that message that this group is built around him. I always felt it was, it was a, a group of guys that played great music, and I was just brought into it, and I felt fortunate to be part of it. And I never uh, gave it those kind of thoughts, or no one ever said to me, okay, this is a group built around George Santana. Uh, and, 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 and George never came across to me that way either. The Malo story for me began around 69 or 70. There was two major nightclubs in, in uh, the San Francisco Mission District. One was um, the Ghetto Club on Mission Street, which is now called uh, El Tapatio, and another club called the Nightlife on San Bruno Avenue. And uh, the two bands that were kind of playing Latin rock music then, one was a, a copy band, uh, called uh, Soul Sacrifice, and that's the band I was playing with. It was a pretty much an all Filipino band, and uh, we did all you know Santana covers and top forty covers, and we played at the the Ghetto Club. And at the nightlife was the Malibus, and the Malibus eventually changed the name to Malo, and we were kind of rivals. And I was approached by um, some of the guys in Malo to come and join their band. They said they had a record deal. I, uh, I, I, I turned them down because of my loyalty to the, to the band. And they asked me a second time, and I turned them down again. The third time they, they asked, they offered me a $500 signing bonus. So I guess I sold myself out kind of cheap, but I was, I was 16 years old. And $500 was a lot of, lot of money, you know. <laughs> so I joined the band after they recorded the album. I uh, actually wrote the words in algebra class with a girl that I had was in love with at the time, and uh, she actually broke my heart. But uh, to this day, she doesn't know I wrote this song for her, so it's kind of a little bit longer, longer story than that, but uh, that's kind of like the synopsis of it right there. I remember uh, going to rehearsal one day, and uh, I, th I think we were in, uh, in Jorge's car. He had, a little, uh, he had a little Camaro, and we were going to practice, and we're listening to the radio, and all of a sudden it hit. Boy, we jumped up. <laughs> we started crying and screaming that uh, our record was on the air. A lot of babies being made at that time. A lot of babies. <laughs> I said, just don't blame me. <laughs> <laughs> We were all so excited just to be doing a, a record and having the opportunity that, I don't know, maybe, maybe we could have argued a little bit more in Richard's favor to keep him in, but we didn't. So it was put to us like, he's out, that's it. Mm -hmm. So we recorded the song Suavecito, and I think the very next day, David Rubison told him you're out. You found yourself out of Malo. Mm-hmm. It was, you know, things, you know, when you're young, you, just things happen, you know. Well, I felt like part of me was gone because, like, I mean, you've been on my side for so long, you know. And we used to sing, like, I mean, we were like, uh, we were like Sam and Dave, you know. Mm -hmm. we, you know, like the, the, like the Righteous Brothers, you know what I mean? We had that harmony and everything. You know, and then I, I found myself, by my, I found myself by myself. The best times, I think, were in the beginning when, when there was not a lot of pressures and lots of uh, you know, bickering and all these kinds of things that happen sometimes in groups. 
because when they got down to the business of playing music, like when we were at the heliport practicing and stuff, I mean, boy, it was, the music was incredible. I mean, just it's just like they're they're free, you know, to express themselves in any way they want. And then when we got you know back into the business mode, it was a little different. But the folly of youth. So I wanted to be out front, you know. There it was. A record was out. We had a hit, you know, song on the radio, and I wanted to be out front. Totally forgot about George, you know. And that's my own youthful arrogance. And I'll be honest, it was youthful arrogance. It was very difficult for me, that though he's, he he was a great player. I mean, his mind and, and be able to, to do things because yeah, well, we sit down to, together. I mean, he would come to me and say, "Hey, Pablo, look at this. You know what chord?" And I knew because I had bought up books and books of chords. And I just would learn, I mean, all the chords. What do you think? Put this chord in here. And once that happened, I hear it, then it, I'm gone. It's just, that's it. Then I'm all over the place, yeah. And so we would do that. But there's something else that somehow, like, even him and Georgia, the kind of that didn't click too much. Uh, that, uh, that's the feeling that I would get, you know. They weren't, you know, too much. And George was my friend, in a sense. And he was too, but... It had to do with attitude, maybe. He had a strong attitude. But yeah, I see it now. That yeah, but they, they never lost sight of what are we what are we marketing here? Who's the focal point? Right. I don't know. It just it, it I didn't feel right. Me, me. And so I even went to the manager because now we were in the we were on the second album, working on the second album and we were work you know, at the rehearsal studio. And it really got to me like that, and I and I couldn't. It's something his, his 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 way of how he was and not playing. Personality. His personality is something in him that is just I, I I couldn't I couldn't accept it. That part I couldn't accept that. Whatever that was, I have no idea. And so in so I didn't want to fight that. And so I remember I uh, I went to the office because the offices were there too, and I went to Chris Wall, and he said, "Can I talk to you?" I said, yeah. And I said, uh, you know, I'm, I'm quitting. I quit. He goes, well, why? I said, no, I just I think I just want to quit. That's it. And he goes, no, something happened. What is it? And so I opened up and said this. And he says, well, well, no. Well, let's see. Let's ask the band. See what they say. And so you stay here. So he went over there. And went, you know, and I don't know what. He, he had a meeting or something. And then he came back, and he says, he says, no, he says, you know, you're, you're the band. And you're, I mean, if anyone needs to go for it, then it's got to be able. And, the, and then I felt bad. I said, oh, gee, now, because of me. Uh, but that wasn't my intention, see. And that's it. So they decided, no, no, you're, 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 you're the sound, you're it. Is that why Abel was let go? And that's how he was let go.